Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. A lot of athletes tonight. We're going to start out with an athlete, Ken Howard, who died recently at the age of 71. Ken Howard was 6'6". He was a basketball player on his high school team in Manhasset, New York, and that gave him an idea for a television show, and he was the star of The White Shadow, good show in the late 70s, early 80s, on CBS, his nickname on his team was the White Shadow because he was the only white kid on the team. And on television, he played a former Chicago Bull who had a knee injury and he became a high school coach. Here's the theme song from the White Shadow. <laughs> Ken Howard got his big break as an actor in the Broadway version of 1776, where he played Thomas Jefferson opposite Blythe Danner, Gwyneth Paltrow's mother. And he also got to know Bruce Paltrow, her father, and here he talks about how that led to the White Shadow. The film of 1776, Blythe Danner played Martha Jefferson, and we had already met each other on Broadway. And all this time, I was getting to know her husband, who I liked very much, Bruce Paltrow, who's a producer. Very funny guy, very decent guy, great to work with in this business, and I brought him basic idea for the white shadow so i was established enough that i'd done a couple of series so i had network approval and all that and we put together this idea and basically sold it to the network on our own it was our baby our project when i went to bruce he was smart about it he said you know network the powers that be they get real nervous about the actor as creator he said so you'll be the star i'll be the creator and we'll, we'll share the profit in it and i said fine <laughs> and also he did the great work on it. I, I brought him the premise. It was an interesting premise. A guy who was a pro, who towards the end of his career takes on a job coaching in a ghetto school and gains a respect and deals with all that. It was that idea. And then he built it and cast it and all. And it was a real homemade project, very good hearted, I think. And the network then, I don't, I think they could be a little more independent, at least at CBS. They didn't check what marketing, because marketing would have said, we don't know, we've never heard about anything like this. This was 1978, and it was a team that was going to be predominantly black ball players, as was the assistant president. Was, this was a reach back then, and they gave it to us. And then we had always felt that if we could, which was a lot to hope for, we get critical acclaim and also claim, acclaim from the sports press. It was a good sports show. They looked like they really can play. And from the black or African, African-American, I think, was a term coming in just then. But those three areas, and which we got. So we were respected that way. And then CBS stayed with us, even though our ratings were good. But I always wondered back then why they weren't looking more specifically at the demographics. Because even when we were losing to a show like Little House on the Prairie, if you looked at the map, obviously we were taking Philadelphia, New York, Cleveland, Chicago. You know, we were taking urban areas for a part the racial aspect of the show. But also because it was a basketball show, it was kind of a street show. So I think that'll be my epitaph. I mean, I think I'm more connected with that role than anything else. And I remember saying to Bruce early on, you know, or maybe he said it to me that, look, if this is what you're identified with, why not? I mean, about as good a role model as I'd want to be. Well, that show wasn't a bad legacy to have. We're going to move on now to Joe Garagio, who died recently at the age of 90. He was a journeyman ball player for the St. Louis Cardinals. He grew up, by the way, right across the street of Yogi Berra. When we talked about Yogi Berra, we mentioned that. After that, he became very popular as a TV broadcaster and then just a general TV celebrity. I met him a lot of times in the early 70s. I don't know. I thought he was a journeyman broadcaster and a journeyman TV celebrity. But people seemed to like him, and I could never figure out what the attraction was. And he was on the Today Show for a while, and here's Savannah Guthrie talking about him. Joe Garagiola, who started off, as you know, as a baseball player and went on to a Hall of Fame broadcasting career, died on Wednesday. He was a man who always knew how to start off the mornings with a smile. <laughs> Joe Garagiola was known for his folksy comedy and commitment to family. Joe was born in 1926 in the Hill, the same close-knit St. Louis neighborhood as lifelong friend Yogi Berra, who died last year. Garagiola won the World Series in his rookie year, playing for his hometown St. Louis Cardinals. He played eight more seasons before becoming an announcer with his down-home sense of humor. Dion could have beaten them if they were playing in an airport or if they were playing in a telephone booth. Garagiola called baseball games for nearly six decades. He also spent his mornings here at Today, serving as anchor in the 60s and 70s, and returning in the 90s. 
I used to sleep till six, seven o'clock in the morning. Now here I am. This morning. Oh, great. Joe earned a special Peabody Award for his work and also hosted several game shows, even filling in on The Tonight Show for the legendary Johnny Carson. After 57 years, he retired in 2013 and a year later was just the third recipient of the Buck O'Neill Award, the Baseball Hall of Fame's Lifetime Achievement Honor for work off the field. He raised grant money for the underprivileged and was a strong advocate against chewing tobacco. It's not smokeless, it's dangerous. In 2014, he reflected on his years of charity work and outreach. People say, you have a great ministry. I said, I don't have a ministry. God gives us all a job to do, and we should recognize that and let's do it. Athlete, author, anchor, announcer, and family man. Well, there's two things I'd like to mention about Joe Garagiola. The first is he conducted one of the most cringeworthy episodes ever on television. John Lennon and Paul McCartney had never been interviewed in depth on American television. In 1968, they came to the U.S. to promote their new Apple Corporation, and they decided to do it on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. The only problem was Johnny wasn't there that night, and Joe Garagiola was standing in, and he did the interview, and it was a debacle. Joe Garagiola interviewed him like he was interviewing a shortstop. And John Lennon later said it was one of his worst moments on television ever. And I watched it, and it truly was. There's no reliable tape of that interview, which is too bad, because for historical purposes, you really have to hear it. The other Joe Garagiola moment is Fred Willard doing his Garagiola imitation in the movie Best in Show. It's one of the most hilarious scenes ever. Here he is with Jim Piddock, and they're announcing the dog show together. She is really giving him a thorough going over. Are all judges that thorough? I mean, yes, she looks yes. at the teeth. Very important that all the attributes are examined. Uh, teeth, eyes, what ears, oh, gums. Sh- am I seeing right? Where's she putting her hands now? Uh, she's just checking out the dog's testicular area oh. to make sure <laughs> to make sure that uh, that everything is intact. I hate to go out on a date with Judge uh, Edie Franklin, have her judge me. That would be no fun. Now she's having a ball. Why do they have them run away from him and then back up? What's the point of that? What are they looking for? Looking for the gait and movement of the uh-huh. dog. And it's very important to see the small angles. Good way to judge a woman. Have her run away from you and then run back. One of those birds on Canopy Street. Yes. I'm used to seeing them run away from me more often than <laughs> run towards me. Uh, now, what is that? Is that that's a, a bloodhound, isn't it? No, I think this is a tremendous dog, and I would say maybe in two to three years this could be a champion dog. Just trying to get a little playing time in. Uh, you know what would be funny? I don't know if they could do this. Uh, uh, just an idea off the top of my head. Why did he put the blood on, put on one of those Sherlock Holmes hats and put a little pipe in his mouth? Are they ever allowed to do anything like that, dress up a dog in a funny way? No, that's, uh, that's not quite what the uh, purpose of these shows is. But it would, I think it would really get the crowd going. You know, you know what I mean? The Sherlock Absolutely, Holmes hat yes. with the pipe. I don't know if you could make it look like smoke's coming out of the pipe. <laughs> I'd get a kick out of it. Now, that looks like a fast dog. Is that faster than a greyhound? Well, if you put him in a race, who would come in first? You know, if he had a little jockey on him going. Uh, let me ask you this. If you're going to put him on a football team, which would be your wide receiver, which would be your tight end? Who can go the farthest the fast? Well, I, I don't know any dogs that play football. <laughs> I'm having some fun with it. You know, they talked about Joe Garagiola's sense of humor, and he didn't think that was funny, but it was. We're going to move on now to Johan Cruyff, who died recently at the age of 68. He was the great soccer player from the Netherlands. Some people call him the greatest European soccer player ever, and he helped Netherlands to the 1974 World Cup where they led West Germany but ultimately lost. Here's English soccer great Gary Lineker talking about Johan Cruyff. Johan Cruyff was, I suppose for any football fan, certainly of my generation, one of the greatest players of all time and um, certainly goes into that category. I would say quite probably the best European footballer in history. Also, a very rare breed in the sense that not only was he a world-class footballer, but he was also a world-class coach, one of the great coaches of all time as well. Now, I can't think of anyone else who's done that. So he's unique in that sense, but also his great legacy to the sport, what he's given the sport and the style of his football and uh, the grace and the through to the way Barcelona and Spain play nowadays. That's um, to his creation back in, in, in the time when he started a coaching and brought in La Masia at Barcelona taught kids in a different style, etc. So the game owes a lot to him. He's done so much uh, for uh, the sport of football that I think anybody would, would be very sad to see him go. There are not too many players that get a bit of skill named after them, um, but the Cruyff term was one. Um, I think we all remember that term, if you're old enough, the little turn and the back flick. 
and uh, completely wrong footing um, the fullback on that occasion. Yeah, and it was named the Cruyff Turn. To invent something like that um, is pretty unique. Now, if you know Johan, you would understand that. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to work for him at Barcelona for a year. And he was the best player in training most of the time, even though he's obviously way past his, his sell-by date in terms of playing. So he was an extraordinarily talented um, individual, but also a great visionary on the game. The things that he saw, you could tell he was extraordinary as a coach. I learned so much. Here's a little of Johan Cruyff in his own words. And there's a lovely ball through. Cruyff is in here. As long as you look to the certain way of playing, everybody can play. Cruyff making ground to get himself under that. Oh, a beautiful dummy from Cruyff. Getting the ball. Treat the ball well. Let it be your friend. Dutch, and this might be another one. Here comes Cruyff now. It is. When they saw us playing, everybody was happy. They just went home laughing. If you can laugh and enjoy yourself, it's one of the most important things it is. Well, we're going to move on to Jack Mace, who died recently at the age of 91. He was the designer for the United States Information Agency, whose model American kitchen was part of an exhibition in Moscow in 1959, the stage for the famous argument between Nikit Khrushchev and Richard Nixon about capitalism and communism, which was one of the Cold War's most memorable confrontations. Khrushchev was a Russian premier, Nixon was the American vice president, and the kitchen debate was the Cold War at its height. You could show us American possibilities, and then we could say, here is what American possibilities are. How many years has America existed already? 300? 150 years of independence. Well then, we will say America has existed 150 years, and this is her level of achievement. We have existed not quite 42 years. And seven years from now, we will be on the same level of achievement as America. And the following years, we shall continue to surge ahead. And when we shall overtake you at the crossroads, we will greet you amiably. And after that, if you wish, we can stop and tell you, please follow us. And for people everywhere, there must be a free exchange of ideas. There are some instances where you may be ahead of us. For example, in the development of the thrust of your rockets for the investigation of outer space. There may be some instances, for example, color television, where we're ahead of you. But in order for both of us to be in what are they ahead of us? Wrong, wrong. We are ahead of you in rockets as well as in this technique. I do not capitulate. <laughs> you, you must not be afraid of ideas. Look, we That's what we're telling you. Don't be afraid of ideas. We have nothing to fear. The time has passed when ideas scared us. We are not afraid of ideas. Yes. Well, then let's have more exchange yeah. of them. We all agree on that, right? Got a show. But what I mean is this. Here you, here you can see the type of tape which will transmit this very conversation immediately. And uh, this indicates the possibilities of increasing communication. And this increasing communication will teach us some things, and it will teach you some things, too. Because after all, you don't know everything. If I don't know everything, then I would say that you know absolutely nothing about communism, nothing except fear of it. You have said, every, every word that you have said has been taken down, and I will promise you that every word that you have said it will be reported in the United States, and they will see you say it on television. I doubt it. That's why I want you, the Vice President, to give your word that my speech will be recorded in the English language. Telecast over TV. Would it, it will be, yes? Certainly it will. Certainly it will. Yes. And at the same token, uh, everything that I say will be recorded and translated and will be uh, carried uh, all over the Soviet Union. That's a fair bargain. <laughs> and Nixon underestimated Khrushchev there, just like Kennedy did a couple years later. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Nike genius, Sid Tapps. And we're going to close tonight with the 6th Street Viaduct Bridge in Los Angeles, which was died at the age of 84. It was constructed in 1932, but had to be demolished this year because of its seismic instability. They didn't think it would withstand an earthquake. Featured prominently in many movies taking place in Los Angeles, including one of my favorites, To Live and Die in L.A. So we're going to close with Wang Chung and the theme song from that movie. Get up, get up.